What's good, everybody, and welcome to another episode of the What's Good Games podcast live on Twitch at twitch.tv slash what's good games. Brittany Brombacher is here. Hello. How's it going? I'm great. I think it's delirium. I think the delirium has set in. 100%. I was pretty much just dead to the world yesterday. I'm Andrea Renee, by the way. Welcome to the show, everybody. We had a fantastic weekend with our three-year anniversary stream on Saturday and then our Patreon exclusive streams on Sunday. And then I think we both just like flopped down and we're like, okay, it, we just need to everything to be quiet for a while. Yeah. <laughs> Speaking of flopping, you know what I really miss? I miss you. <laughs> I miss John. I miss Mav. I miss Steimer. But I miss that magic harp that you got me. Oh, yeah, the Magikarp. The flopping Magikarp. It is my soul in a stuffed animal, and I miss it a lot. I think I might FaceTime you just so you can wind it up for me and let it flop around. Listen, you say the word, and I will make the flopping happen. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for joining us live on the show. Of course, you can join us at 11 a.m. Pacific time every Monday morning right here at twitch.tv slash what's good games or of course you can watch it at youtube.com slash what's good games afterwards or of course enjoy it on your favorite podcast service wherever you listen to podcasts we've got a bunch of people in the chat I see the pillow wall is already up and going strong we have a bunch of new subscribers who have access to those custom emotes on twitch which is very exciting. We're going to be doing some polls in the not too distant future to find out what you guys want. We have some ideas already for the next wave of emotes, but we do want you to know that if you want to help support what's good games, if you've got Amazon prime, you've got a free Twitch subscription. All you have to do is open up your browser, have one window logged into Twitch, one window logged into Amazon, go to Amazon, get you hit your prime membership and hit connect accounts. Boom. Wow. Thank you, Andrea. Done. You're um, so good at that. It's like you've made a video on it. It's like I made a video and I actually edited it, but I just haven't uploaded it yet. So I'm one <laughs> I step I think this I'm is like the new running closer. thing. <laughs> Maybe by year four, we'll get that bitch published. It's going to happen this week. Now that most of the stress of preparing for the anniversary stream is behind us. Uh, thank you to everybody who joined us on Saturday, who watched our videos, to the community members who submitted videos for our fantastic community look at why you guys love what's good games it was just so many feels Brittany so many feels and it's I mean, don't get me wrong we have a lot of fun doing what's good games obviously we've been doing it for three years we love what we do it's a good time but sometimes you know there is a lot of there not sometimes there's a lot of work that goes into it and there are those moments where you're thinking what am I doing this is a lot of fun but I'm a little stressed right now and then you see videos like that and it just confirms why we do what we do you know, exactly. it's such a good feeling. I thank like, you. I watched it Saturday morning while we were going over the final edit. That's um, Christian and I, Pixel Brave. Shout out to at Pixel Brave for doing a fantastic job with that video. And I cried like three separate times because I was just like so overwhelmed. And already in the chat, we have Danny gifting more subs so people can use those custom emotes. Very exciting. Thank you so much for that generosity. And the funny stuff video, though, Britt was also. <laughs> It's also a good time. Oh, um, as I had mentioned on the stream, there's a lot of clips that kind of hit the cutting room floor every week when we do our test records here at What's Good. And I put some of them together combined with some of the fantastic clips that Britt puts together for social media every week. And what came out of it was chef's kiss. Oh, God. It's no. Yeah. One of these days. Maybe when we don't give a fuck anymore, we can publish some of the real NSFW ones. <laughs> I mean, there's there's definitely some bad ones in there for sure. But we're not going to talk about those right now because we have to get to the news eventually. But we do have just a couple of announcements. Later today at 4 p.m. Pacific time, I am going to join Josh Makuga on his YouTube channel for the Josh Makuga show. If you're a fan of kind of funny games, you may have seen Josh Makuga do Josh Purdy. But he also hosts a channel, not a channel. He hosts a show, I should say, on the History Channel called Eating History, and he has been stumping to take Alex Trebek's job when he eventually retires. So he's a great guy. He's like, hey, come by my show. So I'm doing that at 4 p.m. Pacific time live. I have the tweet out on at Andrea Renee, but I believe his channel name is the... 
I have it here, the Casual Mafia. But if you just oh. go to at Josh Makuga, that's M-A-C-U-G-A, you can grab the link there and join us at 4 p.m. Should be lots of fun. And then, Britt, we've got other streams happening right here on What's Good Games later this summer. We do, because I was thinking, you know, this last weekend, it was really busy. And we go back to back to back streams. And it's like, well, are things finally slowing down? And then Andrea goes in the show notes and writes, never. <laughs> it's like, yes, baby girl, you are correct. Things are not slowing down. Maybe for like a week or two, it'll be a little eh, chiller than normal. But this summer, we plan on doing lots of streams and live reacts related to all of the fun summer gaming streams that we're getting. So, for example, on Saturday, June 6th at 10 a.m., there's the Gorilla Collective. We plan on being on twitch.tv slash what's good games and streaming our live reacts to that. And then on June 11th, we have EA Play at 4 p.m. And then we have a cyberpunk event, cyberpunk event, which does not have a time yet. And then if you're looking forward to July, we have the Ubisoft Forward event. I think July is also when Microsoft is doing their big first party stream. So the streams will be coming. They will be, it will be flowing like river, like a river <laughs> of water. Yes. Maybe wine, but maybe whiskey. But there will be water, wine, and whiskey during these streams. I have a, I have a sneaking suspicion. But that what we're good. trying to say is if you haven't joined us for any of our live content yet, if you're just a diehard podcast listener, for example, uh, you may want to head over to twitch.tv slash Games. Give us a follow. Maybe turn on your stream notifications so you see when we go live. Because we're going to be doing a lot more live content throughout the summer months as we all remain safely in isolation. So that's, I think, it for the announcements. Why don't we get into some news but before we do that, I want to tell you that this episode of What's Good Games Live is brought to you by the v Defenders of the Video Game City pin. We unveiled a custom pin a few months back that was intended to be sold at PAX East 2020. Due to COVID-19 pandemic worldwide situation, the pin was delayed by several weeks. When it finally arrived, I was like, what am I going to do with all these pins? We decided, why not sell them? You can buy them on our website. I believe we have a link. I just dropped it in chat. A link in the chat, and we will post it in the show notes. So if you're listening on podcast or at YouTube, you can head on over there. The pins are amazing. They're super adorable. And $5 from every pin sold is going to benefit the state in the game fun that Anita Sarkeesian talked about on the show last week. That charitable effort, of course, benefits four fantastic charities, raising awareness about mental health, which is particularly poignant right now because life is hard. Life is hard it's for hard. everybody. And when stuff gets stressful, sometimes you just need someone to talk to or you need other people to connect with. And we think that the four charities that are part of the Stay in the Game Fund are doing some great work, including our longtime friends at TakeThis.org. So again, we're happy to support those charities. So if you want one of those custom pins, you can head to the website and snag yourself one of them. Yeah. All right. And Lizzie D in the chat that. says, super excited for mine to come as well as my new pride shirt. So <gasps> we'll talk about the pride shirt on the podcast on Friday, but we did debut our new pride design at whatsgoodgames.com slash store. Again, super excited to be partnering with GLAAD, the Gay Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. So hopefully you guys will check those out. But without further ado, I think it's time to get into some news. <laughs> our first story, Brittany. I don't know if I was ever going to be prepared to talk about Anthem again, but here we are. Guess what? Would you like here to read are. this one? I would love to. <laughs> are you ready? Let's I'm go. I'm as ready as I'm going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Anthem 2.0. Don't expect the overhaul update anytime soon. This comes from IGN. So Bioware has issued an update on the state of, Anth of the Anthem overhaul, noting that the revamp is still in the incubation period, and that the creation of a new version of the game will be a, quote, longer process. In a statement on the Bioware blog, Project lead Christian Daly outlined the current state of Anthem 2.0, noting that regardless of the current circumstances, the team is committed to the project. The 30-strong team behind the game are currently working from home due, the, due to the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, but Daly notes that the game's incubation phase has kicked off. That incubation just makes me think of like an egg hatching. You know what I mean? It's like a, it just takes my brain somewhere else. All right. In his own <laughs> words, Daly describes the incubation phase as a prototyping period. We are starting to validate our design hypothesis, Daly statement reads. We are going back and experimenting slash prototyping to improve on the areas where we believe we fell short and to leverage everything that you currently love about Anthem. According to Daily, the nature of this approach means that Anthem 2.0 will be a longer process, so don't expect the new version of the game to arrive anytime soon. 
Quote, the team is small, but the whole point of this is to take our time and go back to the drawing board. Daily notes, a small team gives us the agility a larger one can't afford. Daily also talked about transparency and assured fans that they would see things that look awesome but end up on the cutting room floor or things that you might think suck that you feel we are spending too much time on. In the spirit of experimentation, the team wants to bring those interested in Anthem along for the ride, but Daily notes that, quote, seeing how the sausage is made is not always pretty. That's something we're very familiar with here at Westview <laughs> Games. Anthem's overhaul was announced in February with Bioware manager Casey Hudson admitting the game, quote, needs a more satisfying loot experience, better long-term progression, and a more fulfilling endgame. Clearly, much of that is still in the ideas phase with hands-on development work yet to begin. Daily doesn't give a sense of how long that might take. I so mean, you okay let's yeah, go yeah so listen this was we knew that some kind of an update was in the works after casey made the statement that the game isn't dead it's not canceled that they are going back to the drawing board and hopefully going to incorporate some of their original ideas that they clearly didn't get to at launch i still think that this game has potential we don't need to rehash everything it did wrong right now. We've done that on this show. Plenty of other people have done that. We're not here to drag Anthem or Bioware through the mud for their mistakes. People make mistakes. What I appreciate is that they acknowledge that things went awry and that they want to recommit and bring it back to what their original vision was. And I'm here for that because I think that Anthem had the potential to be a really cool game. I love the flight mechanics. I love the idea of the javelins. I love the idea of this world and some of these characters that they introduced. It just all didn't quite come together the way that they wanted it to. And if I think they scale back some of these live service or ongoing game mechanics that were seen to be so popular and go back to what Bioware does best, which is you know single player RPG adventures with meaningful relationships and awesome narrative. And I banging. Th- right? Banging, of course. Romance. Bring us back some romance, romance. Bioware. I think that they have the makings of something that could have a revival that would be really meaningful. That's exactly what they need. After Andromeda, especially, people were not... They weren't the kindest to Bioware, even though I personally really like Mass Effect Andromeda, but apparently I'm in the minority there. Who could say? But then when... it when I loved, uh, I loved Andromeda. I mean, listen, yeah. it was rough chuckles at the beginning, but after the patches, like, that game is great. It's definitely not the best Mass Effect game. Don't at me. You know who you are. But it's super fun. <laughs> oh, God. Don't get her started, chat. Please don't get her started. God, for love of God, we'll be here all day. My poll um, on Twitter said and proved the definitive best Mass Effect game is Mass Effect 2. <laughs> I mean, and your Twitter poll is the definitive answer. Obviously. It is known. <laughs> obviously. Jeez Louise, hair flip. Uh, but yeah, when, when it came to Anthem, obviously it... Uh, <sighs> You know, the thing is, is I still haven't even played more than maybe five to 10 hours of Anthem. I, like, I haven't touched it. And it's kind of sad. But what's f- going to be fascinating about this, knowing how much was on this, how much was on the line for this in terms of Bioware's reputation, how it's a team of 30 is very small, like uh, K- Daly says here. It's going to be interesting to see how this turns out. Is it going to be a, a No Man's Sky situation? Or is it just going to continue to flip it and flop like that Magic Carp that I love so much that's in the house or the studio or wherever it is in Los Angeles. And is it, how do you relaunch this game? Like, what do you do to entice people to come back once it is ready? No, there's, those are a lot of great questions. And I think that it's a very complicated answer because there are people who are going to hate this game just because EA published it. And just because EA is still publishing it. And that to me is tragic that people won't give it, another shot because of the publisher, even though we know that Bioware has put out quality games, but there's people that feel like they've been burned by Bioware. And I don't want to tell them that their feelings aren't valid because that $60 game at launch was not really enough for the value compared to everything else that was available on the market. And especially now when gamers need to be more discerning about their dollars than ever, even though video game spending is up, which we're going to talk about in just a little bit, I think that, you know, Bioware needs to take the reins on all of the marketing copy and all of the messaging, but I don't know if EA is going to let them do that is the the concerning part. I think that if Bioware is just transparent and says, hey, 
we're a group of people who are real people with faces and families and feelings. <laughs> and let us talk to you as creators, to you, our fans. I think that they could have a really great moment with their fan base to say, this is the game that we are really proud to debut to you. And I would love to see that. And I think that that could be really compelling. However, do I think that's going to happen? Probably not. And that's kind of a bummer. It's tough when major publishers that are rightly concerned with making sure that they're making enough profits to care for their thousands of worldwide employees don't look at what is resonating with the gaming community. It's interesting. We were talking about this on this panel that I hosted at Gamesbeat Summit, the influencer, the gaming influencer panel with Mari Takahashi, Joven Shire, and Mrs. May talking about this idea that the gaming audience is much more critical and much more discerning than, let's say, a general TV audience. Because gamers have a deeper-seated passion with the projects that they love or with the games that they love, and it feels like we're more connected to them. And I can't quite put my finger on why, but it means... We're passionate. Yeah, it just means that you have to be transparent. You can't try to hoodwink, you can't try to deceive or trick, like... We're done with that. We see this. Remember when we talked about this with the Xbox too? Oh yeah. The, uh, our our brethren, the gamer, the gamer uh, loves to try to prove people wrong and try to like get sneaky. Like I see what you're trying to do there. You're trying to be sneaky squirrel. I'm going to call you out. But going back on what you were saying about transparency, I actually think this is a really good first step. Um, the whole blog post is on blog.bioware.com or something like it, it's one of those URLs. But you know, Christian does introduce himself, talk about his role on Bioware, what he has been doing. He says that he's been silently stalking people for the past year on Reddit, EA forums, Twitter, et cetera. Later on in the blog post, he says that he wants to start putting together some regular comms, like we talked about, like this blog, maybe some live streams, concept art posted on social media, actual interactions with the development team. So I think this is a really good first step for maybe EA is kind of saying, okay, you guys, like, this is your thing. You, you know, when people think about Bioware, they don't, Obviously, like EA has a big, you know, uh, a shadow kind of looming over it. And I say that and I'm yes. not trying to like shit on everyone, but like that's just the reality of it. Of when people course. think of Bioware, they think of the Bioware that they knew and loved growing up with, right? Like the Bioware that put out all those fantastic games, those RPGs. And like I said, their reputation has recently faltered. And I think a lot of that has to do with this assumption that EA is meddling and kind of, you know, controlling the message. And we feel like we've lost our best friend Bioware. So maybe this is a good step forward with, anthem and maybe with their other games going forward if we get that dragon age game in the next 20 years that'd be fantastic if we get some new mass effect shit going on that'd be great but this is a good first step talk to us directly 100 percent. i am ready for it to make a comeback make a comeback do it. anthem we believe in you all right moving on gamescom confirms its dates and opening night live showcase event so we already knew that gamescom's physical event has been canceled but they have committed to a digital event and jeff Keeley this morning put out a few more details they've moved to an all digital event of course in the wake of the coronavirus concerns writes GameSpot. the show was scheduled to take place august 25th through the 29th but the new digital event instead will be held august 27th through the 30th so mark your calendars that shifts the date for opening night live held by Jeff Keighley, which will now be on August 27th. According to the announcement, Gamescom will serve as a content hub for news and publisher events. Unlike the standard Gamescom, the digital event won't require a ticket since the events will be streaming. Opening night live will kick off the show in addition to some other special events like Gamescom Awesome Indies and the Gamescom Daily Show. The event will accumulate in culminate is the word there mm -hmm. uh, on August 30th for the presentation of best of show. The annual DevCom conference will take place between August 17th and the 30th running partly concurrent with Gamescom um, quote. Although Gamescom will unfortunately not take place in Cologne this year, it will be impossible to miss it on the internet says the managing director. Our digital concept is showing the way forward in the event of the landscape and many innovations will become an integral part of Gamescom in the years to come. Jeff Keighley promoted the new opening night live date on Twitter and reiterated that it will serve as the end point for the Summer Game Fest digital event. Does that Jeff Keighley ever sleep? Does he ever eat? Um, Is he part Android? <laughs> How are you alive, sir? I have shared meals with Jeff Keighley, so can confirm he eats. He does eat. Okay, I'm uh, just making the, sure. The sleeping and Android part unclear <laughs> so to go into a little bit more detail about these shows so like she just said there's going to be opening night live and there's going to be world premiere and latest announcements which is nothing really new but 
there it is. The Gamescom Studio is going to be a show where there's top developers and they're interviewed about their games to provide background information on the latest announcements. There's going to be Awesome Indies, which is going to be a show about all the important announcements about the most anticipated indie games. And then the Gamescom Daily Show. And then there's Gamescom Best of Show. It's a new format which forms the closing events of Gamescom. The highlights of this year's Gamescom will be summarized and Gamescom Award will be presented. So there's a lot going on here. I guess when you run an all-digital thing, it's kind of what you do. I mean, why not just throw all the spaghetti at the wall? Um, Ooh, I, spaghetti sounds good. and Doesn't it? Yeah. I don't think that this is a bad thing. I think that this is going to be very interesting to see how they do it. Me as a digital video production person, I'm always very curious how these events are going to unfold online. I imagine it'll look very much like any of the live streams that we've participated on at E3 in years past, whether it be GameSpot or IGN or Facebook gaming, it's probably going to look very similar. Well, there'll be like a virtual stage of some sort, or maybe by that time, if it's appropriate, a small stage with just a couple of people on it doing interviews and gameplay demos streaming out. And I think that that's great. It's going to be one of the biggest shows of the year from a marketing standpoint, because that's probably if, if PAX doesn't, Pitch it, uh, yeah. pitch it. If Pax doesn't pivot to a digital event or if they have to cancel their in-person event, that'll be like the the big thing for the new consoles and the new games coming to the new consoles for the fall. So Yeah, because I would say it's safe to assume at PAX West this year, assuming it gets canceled, there were going to be a lot of announcements. And that's kind of what we've seen happen, right, in the past several years. Well, I mean, they've done yeah. this for a long time now where they have fun new, like, game announcements or teases. I mean, look at uh, Larry, and they debuted Baldur's Gate 3 gameplay at uh, PAX East. But, yeah, this is this would be the big event. This is the one. And it's, it's so – I'm just really excited to see how it all goes down, right? Because we have the EA Play event. We have the Ubisoft event. We have the Cyberpunk thing. We have the Xbox thing in July. And then we're going to have this – so I just wish I could be a fly on a wall in those publisher meetings to know who's deciding, okay, we're going to participate in this stream and then we're going to participate in this stream and then we're going to announce something during this stream. And in retrospect, you know, this time next year, let's look back and say, how did this all work out? What was the actual loss by not participating in a physical event, like an E3 press conference? Yeah, we, we did I talk need a time machine, yeah. <laughs> right? Or, like I, yeah. So we could flash forward into the future and see, yeah, how it, how it happens and then come back. I don't want to wait to be and, you know, tell who won the World Series. Um, anyway, we're going to be watching it. We'll be live sure. streaming it. Hang out with us. It'll be fun. All right. Next up, we talked about how video game spending is up and it's up so high that it's apparently Sorry. the highest in U.S. history. Ooh. Brittany. Okay. This comes from the origin. During the first quarter of 2020, United States consumer spending on video game products reached the highest total in U.S. history, according to the NPD Group. The NPD Group calls this year's first quarter a record, driven by digital content spending across console, mobile, and PC platforms, reaching $10.86 billion in total from January to March. This is an increase of 9% compared to the same period of time for last year, according to the report. Sales of video game content reached 9.58 billion in the first quarter, up 11% when compared to a year ago, the NPD group reports. Games were seen across digital console and PC content, mobile and subscription spending, as well as hardware and accessories categories. Games like Animal Crossing New Horizons, which recently broke its own record after becoming the fastest selling Switch game, Call of Duty, Modern Warfare, Doom Eternal, and Grand Theft Auto V helped consumer spending break this record as they were all among the best performing titles of this year's first quarter. Other notable, notice, notable titles on that list include Dragon Ball Z, Kakarot, Fortnite, Minecraft, MLB The Show 20, and NBA NBA 2K20. The MP NPD group reports that a strong growth in sales of Switch, Nintendo Switch hardware and software helped to offset the declines across other hardware platforms, quote, leading the overall video game hardware market to increase 2% in the quarter to 773 million. Video game accessories like game pads, headsets, and cases also saw an increase in sales during this quarter with an increase of 1% in the first quarter. Andrea, those sales reached 503 million. million Lots of numbers. Dollars. Basically, people need an escape right now, and video games are the thing. So they spend money on them. Don't it's incredible. blame them. Yeah, if you go to buy almost anything peripheral-related, the market inventory is low or sold out. I mean, and that's not just with gaming accessories. It's with 
computer accessories as well. I've tried to get some stuff for us here at What's Good only for it to be sold out and be like, oh, it's shipping in like six to 10 weeks or something. So clearly everyone's like, how do I keep myself occupied or how do I keep my kids occupied while I'm trying to work from home? (laughs) And it's interesting because friend of the show, Tara Bruno, who dialed in on Saturday, was talking to me about how her daughter has been playing a lot of Fortnite and how she thinks that she may go pro after quarantine. (laughs) She's been playing so much Fortnite. And she's like, normally, you know, I limit how much she plays. But right now it's like, I mean, why not? It's her way to connect with her friends. And I think that that's why we love video games is that they are online spaces where we can connect with other people. So turns out if you were to. No, go ahead, Britt. I'll say it's interesting to think about it in the sense that if, you know, this unfortunate, very unfortunate pandemic hadn't been a thing that had happened, you wouldn't expect to see these numbers right now, right? Because we're toward the end of this generation's life cycle. Granted, the Switch is killing it. But again, how much of that is related to, well, Animal Crossing slash pandemic, like the a combo of holy shit results. But no, it's, it's, I mean, great. I'm happy that games are here for people. And I'm starting to see all these articles online about video game addiction. Have you been seeing these? They're I feel like Pity. these articles make their way around the internet every so often. And every time I see them, I'm like, Get yeah, the fuck out of here. like video games are like literally everything else in life. You need balance. You can't just play games all day, every day. You need to take breaks, get up, move your body around, have some exercise, interact with other people, whether it be virtually or in person, get some sunshine. You can- yeah, it's like have also a, it's have like a there's a balance. pandemic out. People can't do shit anyway. Let people enjoy a thing that they can enjoy that helps take their mind off of it. Don't try to go out with your political spinning a video game addiction. Just don't don't at me, as Andrea would say. Yeah. But also, I'm going to be fascinated to see what happens with the digital sphere of the video game industry after all this goes down. You know, how many people are going to be swayed to now go fully digital when it comes to their software purchases, right? Because for me it just took the fact that I got old and lazy and I didn't want to have to drive to my local store to pick up games. And plus I kept misplacing the games. You know, when you like open up a game case and the wrong games in there and uh, I'm just so bad at that. Yeah. But I wonder, you know, how many people are going to start, how many people have seen the light, seen the light of, wow, digital is very easy and convenient. As long as you got that hard, hard drive space. It's easy and convenient if you have all of the factors the at play internet. for you. internet, yes, yeah, it's, of course. It, this is the same thing we talk about every time. Like, right. it, I'm with you, Britt. You and I both have talked about our love for physical media and collecting cases and having the thing on the shelf. But the current console makers have almost eliminated the need to have a physical copy. And that's really frustrating. I'm going to be curious to see how they handle physical discs with the new generation and if they're still going to have these what I consider really ridiculous requirements that you have to install all of the files onto your hard drive and copy all the files and then if you don't have the disc then you can't play it it's like well listen did you see that I bought the game because I put the disc in or not you know like that's why I would love there to be some type of license or digital entitlement code that comes with the disc so that way entitlement code so like that yeah so like when i for example i i've used rainbow six siege as a perfect example for this when i originally got that game years and years ago i had the disc and i've never bought that game on digital because i have the disc but every time i want to play it i had to put the disc in the drive and if i go to a different console i have to bring the disc with me and it's it's an inconvenience even though i've bought tons of stuff digitally for that game in the marketplace so what I would love to see is if I I I love the idea of steelbook cases and collector's editions and all of that stuff like continuing but inside put some kind of a digital license code that once I put my disc in the first time I can input this code and then it gives me a digital license that the store recognizes it's like oh this person bought the game and that way somebody can sell the game used for somebody else to play and then the person who buys it used has to deal with the hassle of taking the disc in and out but the person yeah. who buys it new the first time doesn't that feels like a nice compromise i agree i think we need to get you your own press conference i think you can tell <laughs> how you, you tell this to the whole world and make it happen see that chat okay all y'all can show up with your little you little signs to say like Andrea's right. You know, we can all like bounce them up and down and yeah. confetti will throw shit. It'll be great. Listen, Epic Open World, I get that 
the fast loading happens when it's local on the hard drive, that's fine. I honestly don't mind installing the game on the hard drive. That's not the part that makes me mad. The part that makes me mad is that I install the game on the hard drive and then I'm still required to put the disc in the drive. And so if I, like Britt said, if we lose the disc or misplace it or what have you, or if we let a friend like borrow it or whatever, then I can't play the game. That's all. So Trevor asks, what would stop you from buying and just immediately reselling every game? People do that all the time anyway. <laughs> like, I don't know. Oh, so you're saying download a copy of the game and yeah. then you keep a copy of the game and then you sell it and make like some of your money back is probably what they're getting at. Yeah. There would be, uh -huh. be a way to work around it. Okay. So maybe we'll hold off on your press conference. Digital until we watermarking figure out the is a thing. It's a technology that exists. Figure it out, money guys. I believe Figure in it you. out, people. We're just here to talk about your bad decisions. <laughs> um, the sad part about this all is that it won't ever change because people are bad. Some people are bad, I should say. And some people like to cheat and steal and take advantage of others. And those people ruin it for literally everybody else. And you're bad and you should feel bad if that's you. Um, all right. <laughs> that's my 50 cent <laughs> tip of the day. Uh, <laughs> moving, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> Nintendo has okay. filed a lawsuit in a crackdown against Switch hackers. Nintendo of America filed two lawsuits on Friday against Nintendo Switch hacks resellers that sell software to play pirated video games, according to court documents obtained by Polygon. This, of course, is written by Polygon. The first lawsuit was filed on Friday in an Ohio court against Tom Dilt Jr., the alleged operator of the website Uber Chips. The second lawsuit was filed in Seattle court that same day against a number of anonymous defendants from a selection of websites. All defendants reportedly sell products from a group of anonymous hackers called Team Executor. Nintendo's mm. lawyers described the products as an unauthorized operating system and accompanying piracy tools that install it. These products allow users to get around Nintendo's technological protection measures designed to protect its products from unauthorized access and copying. Once it's disabled, players can download the unauthorized operating system and play pirated video games, lawyers said. In an attempt to crack down on hacks, Nintendo is focusing its legal efforts on the resellers. In 2018, Nintendo filed a similar lawsuit against Team Executor, this hack reseller. And in January, it won an injunction against the defendant of the case, Sergio Maharo Moreno. I definitely put uh, that name. Who was yeah. ordered to stop reselling the hacks? Likewise, Nintendo filed a lawsuit in September of 2019 against a ROM website called ROM Universe, which we covered on the show last year, which allows members to download pirated video games for the system and others. Polygon has reached out to Nintendo for more information, but at the time of writing, the Uber Chips website appears to be offline under scheduled maintenance. LOL, LOL, LOL. <laughs> other websites <laughs> listed in the second lawsuit are still operating, however. A kit used for hacking the Nintendo Switch is listed for $47.99, a bargain. The site also <laughs> sells products for the SNES classic playstation mini nintendo 3ds and the game boy advance the websites are offering pre-orders for devices that will circumvent protection measures for the previously unhackable nintendo switch Lite and the newer nintendo switch models nintendo said this is causing tremendous harm to the company lol really nintendo what? lawyers have hundreds of the devices have already been sold hundreds oh, no. hundreds Nintendo is seeking $2,500 per trafficking violation in each of the cases, as well as a permanent injunction to stop operations from these websites. So I added like a little aside here because I saw a story also on Polygon this morning about hackers that are going to crazy mods and turning cool things in Animal Crossing into other things like turning money trays into star fragment trees. And I was like, Listen, I never wow. want to like mess around with mods on my console because it can like brick your console if you do it wrong. Right. Oh, yeah. But like, ooh, star fragment trees sound real cool. Oh, this <laughs> is, uh, I mean, not surprising. Nintendo's never fucked around with this kind of stuff as no. you've read in those previous cases as well. I mean, this is what you got to do. You have to, you have to go hard, go big or go home. Because if you want to make an example and crack that saucy old Nintendo whip and get these people to stop doing what they're doing, that's why I think you see the word tremendous harm to the company. There's been hundreds of these devices. Oh no, when you're unit, when you've sold 50 million or whatnot, Nintendo switches like hundreds, is just a drop in the bucket. But again, I get it. You have to make uh, an example. So people will be less inclined to fuck with your system. Yes. And, I mean, I get it, like, in the sense that I would love to have my Nintendo Switch, and if it could play all of the games on it, that would be fucking phenomenal. As we see, Nintendo has not been the best about bringing their older titles to the Switch, especially with their online marketplace. It's like, 
what is even happening there? Who knows? But you can't do that shit, man. It's it's very illegal and you will get fined. And, you know, you might lose all the progress on your Switch. So, yeah. Just don't do it, man. It's tempting as it is. You're going to get fucked up. Nintendo's going to come out. They're going to fucking hire Reggie Fusen made to come back from Nintendo. And he's going to be, like, lurking outside your door like, hello. <laughs> You're doing bad things. And he's going to, like, look like Mr. X in a trench coat. He's going to have a top hat on. It's going to be fucking intimidating. <laughs> You're going to shit your pants. And Nintendo's going to take a photo of you, publicly humiliate you. And was it worth it? No, it wasn't. <laughs> That's a gif right there, everybody. Also, I desperately want somebody to make this thing that you just described. Feels like a Photoshop challenge waiting to happen. (laughs) (laughs) Well, let's see. You have been challenged. (laughs) Uh, But yeah, essentially, don't break the law, kids. Don't do it. That's your other piece of advice for the day. Don't break the law. All right, Brittany, do you want to read this or do you want to react to this? Um, I will react. Okay. That's what I tend to do. Okay. Here we go. Uh, Our next story. Capcom has changed Nemesis for the Resident Evil 3 remake to reference Resident Evil 4. Da-da-da. Eurogamer writes, in a PlayStation blog post to announce Nemesis' arrival and multiplayer experience Resident Evil Resistance, the Resident Evil 3 remake development team explained why the new Nemesis can infect zombies with parasites, something it could not do in the 1999 PS1 original. It turns out Capcom gave a remake Nemesis in the power and this power in order for it to make sense in the context of the Ganado in Resident Evil 4. Did I say that right? Yeah, you're smart. This was implemented as a means of differentiating Nemesis from Tyrant in Resident Evil 2, Capcom said. We wanted Nemesis to come across as an even more formidable opponent, so we started considering alternative abilities aside from its heavy weapon artillery. We inevitably decided its final ability due to the presence of Ganado in Resident Evil 4, and Ganado are humanoid enemies that are created through being infected with the Plagas Parasite in the original basis for NE Alpha? What's that? Yeah, it's a parasite. It's it's the thing. Okay. When the Plagas activates, it spawns on the neck of its host in the form of a tentacle. Ew. Um, any alpha was created to intimidate, intate, that's the word, this parasitic quality. We wanted infected enemies to be visually similar to the Plagas infected Ganados as a means for fans to piece together how Nemesis fits within the whole Resident Evil franchise. Wow. wow. Britt, would you agree that that's quite the revelation? I would agree that's quite the revelation. So um, can you explain to me what's happening in the story? Because I'm very confused. (laughs) So basically, MTLDR, and again, fair warning, I'm not the most familiar with the Resident Evil 4 lore because it was never my favorite game. I need to get back to it. Uh, So you have Nemesis, which is essentially a tyrant infected with the NE alpha or the NEA, whatever the fuck, the parasite. And so Resident Evil... Zero, one, two, and three, and if you want to count Code Veronica, are very much focused around Umbrella Corporation and their bioweapon research. And then all of a sudden you have Resident Evil 4, which kind of sort of touches on it, but the idea of Resident Evil 4 is like, ah, shit, Umbrella's been disbanded. Oh, no. Oh, no. And then that's why Resident Evil 4 feels like it's such a stark difference, not only just from a gameplay perspective, but also from a story perspective. So this is interesting because essentially what Capcom is saying is that we've kind of built in some new lore to tie Resident Evil 3 and Resident Evil 4 together. Because seeing what Nemesis can do in Resident Evil 3, that was never part of the original plan when this game was originally being developed in 99. So this is exciting because I think what this does is it leads credence to the fact that we're getting this Resident Evil 4 remake. This is obviously a rumor that we have talked about before on the show multiple times because you think, why would you build in this lore for Resident Evil 3 to tie in with Resident Evil 4 unless you plan to bring Resident Evil 4 up in some way, shape, or form? I think Capcom's strategy is, okay, we killed it with Resident Evil 2, therefore the people who are interested and liked Resident Evil 2 who had never played a Resident Evil game before are into Resident Evil 3. So now how do we tie in the Resident Evil 3 fans to Resident Evil 4, specifically to the fans who aren't already loving, who aren't already obsessed with Resident Evil 4, who maybe never played Resident Evil 4? Tie it in, you're going to grab more people in, and I think that's the route they're going. There you go. Whoosh. You did so good. You smile and you nodded, baby girl. That's all I need from you. (laughs) Just make me feel heard. Listen, I will listen to you talk about Resident Evil almost as long as you want. But I just have to admit that most of it I I still don't understand. But I understand more now that I've played a couple of them. So thanks for that. I got you, girl. The more you know. 
And rounding out the news this week, we've got a couple of, in case you missed it, Story of Seasons, Friends of Mineral Town, launches in North America on July 14th. Physical pre-orders on the Exceed Game Store get you an exclusive Strawberry Cow Pocket plush. Yes, this is exciting. So real quick, I got to talk about my Story of Seasons. I have a little show and tell for everyone. So good friend, Miss Ayel, at our Fargo, North Dakota meetup, gave me this copy of Story of Seasons, Mineral Town, but it's all in Japanese. And while my Japanese is vastly improving, it is still not where it needs to be. So I'm really excited we're getting a North American localization in July. And what's great about this is that this is a remake of the Game Boy Advance games, uh, Harvest Moon, which is now Story of Seasons, kind of a complicated licensing issue. But what's great about the localization is that they um, are allowing same-sex marriage, which is really cool because that was something that was never allowed, not allowed, but never done, or maybe it wasn't allowed back then. In the Harvest Moon games and the romancing and the friendship system in these games are really exciting because you get to like have kids with the with the people and you get to give them like apples and turnips and eggs and then they love you. I mean, listen, I'm all for apples and eggs. If you gave me turnips, I'd kind of be like, mm. what if I give you a walnut every single day? A single walnut. Okay, so there's because so I was playing Story of Seasons Trio of Towns <laughs> several years ago. And I, Jason would always look over and be like, what are you playing? And why are you giving people walnuts? I'm like, because if I give people walnuts, they like me. So that was he question. got jealous. <laughs> so I legit bought a whole fucking big old bag of walnuts from Costco. And every single day for about a month, I gave him a walnut. Uh, I don't know if it worked. I think he still likes me. He still lives with me. It's true. I mean, he married you. so He did marry me, but that was after the fact. So now it's like, well, you know, is it worth it? I don't know. I'm hoping he I – hope, I hope my affection – with him went up, but who could say? Of anyway, course. Yeah. You know he loves you. He <laughs> loves the walnuts. Everything's going to be great. Thanks. But no, this is cool. This is the kind of game I think we all could really use right now, especially uh, with The Last of Us coming out uh, next month. Um, yeah, this will be a good little refresher. It's just such a good, happy, feel lucky game where you farm. It's all about the farming, and that's what I'm about, that life right now. Andrea, maybe you should try it. If you like Animal Crossing, maybe you'll like this game. Is there as much decorating? Maybe. No, there's not. That, so that's it's the, de- really, is the, the is decorating, decorating is what that, that has you. Now. Yes, it's the decorating. Oh, I'm gonna I'm gonna stream this afternoon. I've decided. Um, okay. Because I I've been doing some decorating. I've been staying up late, and I we got to visit some fantastic islands on the anniversary stream. But I want to visit more islands mostly so I can keep shopping. So. <laughs> I know it's a, pro- it's a problem, uh, but it's in my passport that I'm a very specific shopper. So um, cool. Uh, I think somebody in the chat asked, where can I get this again? Physical pre-orders are on the X seed games store and it gets you an exclusive strawberry cow pocket plush. Yeah. Strawberry cows make you strawberry milk, but I'm sure that's you, how it works. Yeah. But you, I'm sure you can get this on in the Nintendo eShop as well, right? Yeah. Digitally if you want, but you can't order it. Yeah. Basically, if you, but you want to get the 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 little plushies because these are the kind of plushies you get, aren't they cute? It's very cute. Oh, Thanks. adorbs! I know they're, they're really good. Cute. They're plushies. Uh, and all. also, in big news today, Minecraft passes two hundred million in sales with one hundred and twenty six million monthly active players. Polygon writes that the last few months, Minecraft has seen a 25% player increase as well as a 40% increase in multiplayer sessions. In late March, Xbox announced the educational content would be added to the Minecraft marketplace for free until June. The content partnered allows players to tour the International Space Station, learn to code with an in-game robot, and even tour around monuments in Washington, D.C. Minecraft also got a stunning facelift with the RTX beta in April, adding ray tracing and beautiful realistic effects to the games. So... Minecraft not slowing down, celebrating 11 years, and Minecraft Dungeons is out next week, a week from tomorrow, I believe, on the 26th of May. So if you guys have been wondering, what the heck is Minecraft up to? Turns out, it's super popular. Super popular. It never slowed down. (laughs) No. Did you ever get into Minecraft, like really get into it? No, that yeah. kind of creative building was never really my thing. I played a little bit of it here and there back when I was at Smosh Games because they started a, a Minecraft show. But I just was, it was just never something that drew me to it. But I think the things people create in Minecraft are amazing and phenomenal. And watching that game evolve over the years and seeing what, you know, Xbox and Moyang Studios, which they just had a rebranding as well, have been doing with it. I just love how they're really pivoting and saying, hey, use this as an educational tool. 
and use it as a virtual meeting space. And that's great. I think that it's awesome. So clearly Xbox and Microsoft made their money back on, on Minecraft. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Good job, guys. Well, I mean, when that, when that money. sale happened, I think a lot of people were like, whoa, oh, yeah. is it worth, you know, that much money? I think it was $2 billion, 1.98 was, um, was the, <laughs> what the selling price was, Minecraft. So much money. So, sold for um, uh, $2.5 billion. Oh, God. <laughs> Listen, yeah. I can create art, Microsoft, and you can buy it for billions of dollars. I'll take a million dollars, you know, like. Print art, Minecraft. I, uh, you, we need you know, to like, we need to show people the art you created on the stream. We got to get some screenshots going. Oh my god! You yeah, have, you I, have uh, all of those saved. Oh yeah, I found them later. So part of our anniversary stream, ladies and gentlemen, was a Brit art, Brit draws section, and I drew. Oh, I don't know. I'm trying to find it. It was like six or seven pieces of art, and I'm looking back on it. I'm like, what the flying fuck? <laughs> But we took, we took Patreon suggestions, so really we did, their but fault. It, the manifestations, I don't know. Like, in my head, it looks so much better. But then when it translates onto Microsoft Paint, it just looks like a garbled mess of death. I'm not sure how it happened, but it happened. And people seem to appreciate my art, which is, okay, like, let me get in character. <clears throat> they should appreciate my art because my art is fucking fantastic. And, like, I've told every single one of you, one of these days, the art is going to be worth so much. You're going to be like, oh, my, Microsoft bought minecraft for how much oh that's nothing compared to how much microsoft paid for brit's art it's gonna be like mario paint but brit paint for microsoft no more questions at this time <laughs> amazing i realized this morning that i didn't get to see most of those because that's when steimer and i were taking our quick break yeah and so i have to go back and uh and check those out for sure check it out let's check it out i was going through chat here and the cash family going back to that nintendo story about hacksaws said, you doing this to your system isn't illegal. Them selling you a way to do it is. Nintendo licensing isn't law. All they can do is lock you out of the Nintendo network. Okay. Obviously, I don't remember exactly what I said, but you're not supposed to do it. That's kind of what I'm getting at here. Well, if you sell somebody else's intellectual property, pretty sure that's not legal. Yeah. Right? I, I would think... I mean, I was only a lawyer for a few years of my life, so I can't, you know, <laughs> pretend to know it all. Oh, I must have missed this part of Brit's history. Me too. <laughs> Whoops. Fantastic. Um, uh, spelt wrong, Brit. I saw that story that you um, put in the chat. I'll look into it. We didn't see this really on a lot of other um, outlet websites, so I need to verify it and, and validate it. If it is indeed a thing, we'll cover it on the Wednesday show, or excuse me, the Friday show that we shoot on Wednesday. Um, but we're going to continue on to Dear WGG. So every week we ask you guys to go to whatsgoodgames.com slash Dear WGG and submit questions for the show. We also attempt to take questions from chat, but generally since chat is continuously scrolling, we have a tendency to miss them when they appear in chat but at dear wgg we get them again what's good games.com slash dear wgg if you can't join us live the best way to submit questions for the show is just to go to that website so Brittany, hmm. what do we have in there as i look for the doc oh i don't have the doc up either i okay. had it i closed it out i think i found it okay here we go Smile and dance, kill some time, kill some time while we're looking up the shit. Ooh, ooh. <laughs> um, oh, Grizz, that's kind. Not a question, but I just wanted to say I enjoyed the Saturday stream. It was a great post-birthday thing for me, and the family enjoyed watching it with me. And yes, that includes my three kids. Well, you know, What's Good Games is all about the children. <laughs> <laughs> but shout out to Grizz. Happy belated birthday. I know we said happy birthday to you on the show last week. Um, he's one of our fantastic mods in our Discord community. So thank you for all you do. I'm glad you had a great time. Um, so this is an interesting question. Hmm. Rafael Costa writes, Hi, girls. I've been a patron off and on, but now I've decided to support you girls for as long as I can. Oh, thank you. And since I think you've been doing an amazing job, and it's definitely a delight to hear your podcast twice a week now. Oh, hearts. Thank you. I didn't know if you dive too much onto this topic, but do you think games like The Last of Us 2 or Ghosts of Tsushima will have a drop in sales on launch due to PS5? I have several friends that are not going to buy them on launch and will wait for the PS5 release. I would love to hear your thoughts. Love from Portugal. So just okay. as a refresher, those games it. are launching first, I believe, on PS4 and then 
happening a few weeks later or a month later or whenever the launch date is on PS5, right? I believe that's correct. Well, The Last mm-hmm. of Us is out next month. Oh, actually, wait. Both of these games are out this summer. Because yeah, Ghost July of is Tsushima Ghost. is out in July, right? Ghost of Tsushima. No drinks for me. I said it right. <laughs> so um, that's a great question. I would imagine that people who like The Last of Us are not going to wait for PS5. Now, PlayStation has not announced an Xbox equivalent of smart delivery, where if you bought the game for PS4, you automatically get the game for PS5. I think that is a mistake. I think that it's an easy layup to just say, hey, if you're going to invest in new hardware this year, we want to reward you by just giving you an entitlement for the game that you bought on the last console for free on the new console. I think that's an easy win, Sony. Will they do it? Probably not. But I really hope oh, they you do. don't think so. No, I honestly don't. I think that Sony is going into this next generation confident AF being like we dominated the last generation. Our system was the most popular in the world. We sold more games than anybody else in the world. And we don't have to give nothing away for free because y'all will buy it again. I honestly think that that's their line of thinking. I do. I'm, I mean, you're right. I wouldn't be surprised. Like that's. That would be my line of thinking, too, if I was taking it from that angle. That's exactly what she said. Wow, that was a good one. That was a good one. Good me. Go me. Good job. Uh, Yeah, so people in chat are asking, are we just assuming they're coming to PS5? And I believe, yes, we're just assuming that. I don't think these games have been announced for PS5 at all. Of course they'll be on PS5. Yeah, but of course they will. I'm with... hmm. See, I I would like to think that they're going to allow the smart delivery system with these games. Cause I feel what's it? Wait, didn't final fantasy seven remake. Didn't the developers of didn't square talk about this in some sense, like a little, a little waves back. Am I making this up? Okay. I'm going to look this up. Hold on. I don't know what you're talking about. I, I know in my head. I know what I'm talking about. I know that doesn't translate to much, but okay. well, once you get it yeah, yeah, yeah. figured out, you let me know. But, oh, okay, wait, wait. Final Fantasy VII Remake and other Square Enix games won't get next-gen re-releases and instead will rely on backwards compatibility. So that's so instead of smart delivery, okay, it's all coming together. So instead of like a smart delivery system, it's more along the lines of like, well, if you buy the game on PS4, you should be able to play it on PS5 because of backwards, deliver, backwards compatibility. It's interesting, though, if you get into the minutia of that, if that means that the game is going to be optimized for PlayStation 5 or if you're merely just playing the PS4 build on PlayStation 5 hardware. Because we know that Xbox had a variety of games that were available in backwards compatibility, but not all of them were enhanced for Xbox X or Xbox One X, right? And I would love to see if that's going to be the case. I have to imagine, yes, because it's their first party title. So, like, why wouldn't they want to make them look and perform as best as possible? But, again, they have not confirmed that. And it seems like an easy win to confirm that. But I would guess that they're waiting until after launch to see community reception on how the games perform. And then they'll announce. Because we know that these games are are going to be available to play, as Britt said, through backwards compatibility. But... I mean, maybe they just wait and have another marketing beat in the fall and say, hey, did you love The Last of Us Part 2? Guess what? You can go through the horror and the murder all over again. <laughs> when are we going to get a marketing beat, man? When are we going to get I want to know what the fuck is going on with this. It would be system. nice we don't to have that- see it, right? To, like, know yeah. what it looks like. <sighs> but I don't know. Yeah. They, they, they're doing their own thing, which is, which is fine. Hopefully sometime this summer, I imagine that they'll do a big reveal and they'll show the hardware and they'll show some new games and maybe we'll get a teaser of Horizon Zero Dawn 2 and, oh, you know, maybe we'll get a teaser of Spider-Man 2. Oh. So who knows? Who knows? But no, to answer your question, Raphael, I don't think most people are going to wait. I think people who are early adopters are going to buy and play early and then they'll yeah. probably play again. Once PS5 happens. Um, okay. Uh, Khan asks, I wanted to ask what systems you all prefer and do you do any PC gaming? So we've answered this question quite a few times. We all play on all of the consoles. And Steimer is really the only one who plays the most on PC, but even she doesn't play as much. We actually talked about, did we t- didn't we talk about this in the Q&A yesterday? In the Patreon yeah. Q&A? Um, so if you weren't in our Patreon streams, just to reiterate, we 
all kind of agreed that it's tough for us to separate work from play. And that's why we don't prefer to play games on our PCs because whenever we sit down at the PC, it usually means I'm working. I'm editing, I'm doing graphics, I'm doing stuff for the streams, I'm doing email, what have you. It's really hard for me to separate. I'm sitting down at the PC just to play around and have a good time versus I, I should be doing work while I'm at my work desk. Yeah, I'm the same way. If I sit on a computer, well, I don't sit on a computer. I sit on a desk <laughs> at my computer. I know I'm going to run through like, okay, what's on Twitter? What's the YouTube comments? What's in my email? What's going on? And then I get sidetracked and then I never end up playing games. I did have a dedicated PC because I upgraded my PC a couple years ago. And that really helps. I had a PC specifically for gaming. I didn't have anything on there besides just like gaming shit. But then that PC got old and then it could no longer play the games I wanted to play. And then it was like, I don't even know how to upgrade this thing. And then it just sits. Now it just sits. Well, so it feels like the we, problem. that should be a project for us for the summer. Is uh, Build a PC. Let's tune that baby up. All right. I'm, I want to build a PC. It's something on my bucket list. I've never done it before. I know we've been talking with some people I literally about have, doing it. I literally have all of the parts. So our friends at AMD, uh, shout out to Leslie. She's going to do a build with us at some point. We're talking now about how to maybe do it virtually because nobody predicted that we'd be in shelter in place this long. But hopefully she can come to the studio and help me because I'm really nervous about doing some specific parts. But we have this big, beautiful new case. I have all of the components. I finally was able to find another Elgato capture card on the internet. Hopefully this one actually makes its way to me because I've had several of my orders canceled. Um, and we've got all the pieces and we're going to be doing a live PC build. But we're just delaying. And but that's the PC here. I'm talking yeah. about your PC. Okay. We could do both. Yeah. Okay. Do I, do I, do I, how, how does this work though, Andrea? Do I bring it to your, to the studio? Do I do it from here? Because if I'm left alone without someone supervising me to deconstruct and construct a PC, you're going to see a fire on, on stream. I it's going to blow up. Yes. I think the idea of you traveling with it is just like probably not it could be a thing i can make a road trip <laughs> i mean if you wanted to make a road trip with it you could but i could also come to you when it's safe to do so and we could do it together because um, you'll know what you're doing by that point okay i'm fucking with you now i got you yeah. okay yeah okay or right, actually you know what i want you to commit to coming on a road trip just drive down <laughs> Bring red, drive down. bring Demers. I'll, It'll be fun. I'll strap my PC and I'll put a little seatbelt <laughs> around it, tuck it in every night. I'll like document it on Instagram. <laughs> Series. I'm in, I'm into it. Um. <laughs> okay. So, uh, final question is from Sindel. Sindel Rice. I feel so overwhelmed by the amount of games I want to play. Do you guys get this feeling? If so, how do you deal with it? Because it's driving me up a wall. Uh, if I knew how to deal with this feeling, I would be in a much better place because I have this feeling all the time. It's, it's, yeah. So like right now, you know, I'm working on Divinity Original Sin 2 with my, with my husband because it's a fun, like feel good game. It's just a really good forget about the state of the world kind of game. I'm also wanting to work on Sleeping Dogs. I have another game, two games that I can't talk about publicly yet that I need to try to juggle and the embargo for those is up pretty soon. So it's kind of this what do I play? Where do I even start? And no, I have not mastered that quite yet. I am with you that mastering it is something that you should just put out of your mind. Don't yeah. stress yourself with this idea of having a technique that's going to work every time because life comes at you fast and you got to be willing to adapt. I do find that I benefit a lot from making physical lists lists that I actually hand write out on a piece of paper it, or if you prefer you can make a list like in, a, in an app like I have an app on my phone that I have a task list on as well and I, there's a variety of browser apps and email apps that you can get for that but there's something about writing it out on a piece of paper that works really well for me of games that I'm like okay I want to do this game this game this game this game and then you know just taking them you know one step at a time and being like okay and then you could cross it off your list and that helps and also it's also important to edit. You know, you don't want to force yourself to play something that is either going to take you too many hours or you're not really that excited because then you feel like you're overwhelmed with this idea like, oh my gosh, I have like 10 games I have to finish. But when you sit down and look at them after you've written them out, look at them again and go, do I really want to play all of these games? Or is I do I just feel compelled to play that because I feel like I should for some weird reason I can't put my finger on, but I don't really want to play it. And then just cross that one off your list. Boom. 
yeah, this building is really helpful. And for me, not even with games, but with just everything else, if I have a huge, I'm the kind of person who, unless I write it down and this is like my daily to-do list, whether it's something with what's good or something in my personal life, it's like, okay, if I write it down, I can let my brain just not, I can, I can let my brain stop thinking about it. Right. So that's why in the middle of the night, sometimes if I wake up and I have an idea, I send an email to myself, even if it's at three in the morning, because I know otherwise I will just lay in bed and it'll just keep circulating. And that's just, it's not good for my old noggin, you know, Andrea, but mm-hmm. um yeah, and so oh, Epic Open World asked, is Divinity a feel-good game? I thought it was a dark game. I mean, the story of it's kind of dark, but there's so much silly humor, and it's such a, oh, I don't know how to describe it, tongue-in-cheek kind of game. The developers, you can really tell, like, had fun writing certain scenarios and creating certain characters, and it's such a immersive game that you do kind of just forget about what's going on. So it makes it feel good. Maybe the story is not the most upbeat and happy one. There's not, well, maybe there are unicorns. I can't remember. I wouldn't be surprised. But you do just kind of forget about all the bullshit. You can do anything you want in that game. It's fantastic. Yeah. Anyway. Feel yeah. good. Yes, and I see you in the chat. I definitely think you should take a look at your list and see which ones you can maybe just cross off the list now and be like, you know what? Maybe I just don't play that one right now. Maybe I just focus on the things that I'm really excited about. And then, you know, you can maybe get back to that later. Maybe keep an archive of your list. You can be like, wasn't there a game on one of my lists at once upon a time that I wanted to play? And then maybe if you've yeah. got, got the fancy, you can try it down the road. And that's going to do it for our show for today. Thank you for joining us at What's Good Games Live, everybody, whether you're here on Twitch.tv or on YouTube.com or listening in your favorite podcast app. We'll be back on the Friday show. And as I mentioned, I'm going to be streaming some Animal Crossing in just a little bit. And at 4 p.m. Pacific time today, I'm going to be joining Josh McCuga for the Josh McCuga show on his channel. It's going to be great. And we've got lots more announcements coming for our pride. What's the word? Campaign maybe is the word I'm looking for. I like it. Yeah, I like it. Campaign works. So uh, keep your eyes peeled for that. Again, that merch is all available in the store. Pride Month hasn't even kicked off yet, but we wanted to give you guys time to order and get all that stuff shipped to you because as everybody knows right now, shipping is taking a little bit longer for literally everything. So thank you everybody for joining us. We'll be back. And to everybody else, have a great rest of your week. Bye, everybody.